Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, it's a great, great day across the nation, across the world uh, to celebrate your Irish heritage, of which I have none, but uh, why not celebrate anyway? Got plenty of friends, right? So coming up on the podcast today, uh, Boker remakes a battle classic into a folder, one that I must get, no doubt. Uh, in the state of the collection, we have some Bastinelli's on loan that I want to show off, as well as a, a, a Topps modification and a, 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 an, an arcane design that I must, I must own myself. And then 10 favorite knives with my Carta handles in my collection, all coming up on this edition of the Midweek Supplemental. But first, do you like this show? Do you like knives? Well, check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support over there. You get uh, Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast. You get early access to the Sunday interview show and the Midweek Supplemental podcasts. Uh, without any inter uh, without any um, advertisements during the show, and there's other exclusive content and opportunities. Uh, your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, like hosting, servers, apps, and equipment, as well as knives for review, donation, and giveaway. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So Kaiser is always coming out with new knives. Every year they have a pretty heavy roster of new knives. But this year uh, brings a first for them, and that is a lockback. Uh, it comes to them and us through designer Michael Galovic. Uh, when I when I first saw his name, I, I confused him with a different knife maker. I'm not even going to mention right here. Knife maker I like a lot, but I don't want to cause any confusion. But this is Michael Galovic. And this knife is called the Slicer. And to me, I look at it and it is uh, it's a rat one competitor. It is a uh, a cold steel um, working man or um, a law, American lawman competitor. It is just a straight up work knife. Uh, it's got a nice drop point, 3.74 inches. You know, that's in the um, size range that I like. And it's got contoured G10 handles and a lockback. Uh, it's N N6, N690CO steel. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes these steels are hard for me to say. But look at that beautiful blade and that uh, full flat grind. If you can't see it, just take my word for it. It's a nice uh, drop point. It's got a beautiful pointy acute tip full flat grind, but nothing flashy to this thing. It's just a nice, big, hefty lockback. And that's a new one from Kaiser. That's a, that's a new, uh, uh, a, a new sort of platform that they're trying out. So, uh, I like it a lot. Uh, that might be something we check out over here. Uh, it's thumb stud only, as you might expect from a, um, from a lockback. So, uh, we, we might be checking out that, that Kaiser slicer coming up here. But one knife I know for sure we're going to be checking out here is a Boker, and you don't hear me say uh, you don't hear me say that too often. Uh, this Boker coming out is a uh, folding version of the Smatchet, and the Smatchet is an incredible combat knife, a legendary combat knife from wo World War II. It was designed by uh, Fairbairn and Applegate, and it's a it was a twelve inch double edged leaf shaped. Um, well, all around her, uh, but definitely a combat blade. Uh, issued a lot in the South Pacific. It was good for um, for vegetation as well as uh, fighting. You know, there was a lot of jungle, hand to hand jungle fighting in the South Pacific. Uh, and Apple, Applegate, and Fairbairn were experts in uh, close in combat uh, with knives. So this this is a uh, this new Boker is a tip of the hat to that uh, combat classic. It's got a three uh, three and three quarters inch blade, and a beautiful, uh, beautifully sculpted and sort of wasp waisted micarta handle. And note note how the pivot is is off center. Uh, that to me is emblematic of how difficult it is to design a folder that is totally symmetrical. We're going to get to that later. Uh, what I mean by a folder 
that is totally symmetrical. I, I mean, especially in this sort of daggery um, format. If you look at this blade, it looks just so primed for double edge, but then you look at that handle and you know that that could never happen. Of course, the handle has to be substantially wider than the blade when you have a, a double edge folder. That's why there, there just are not many out there at all. And we're gonna talk about that later too. So uh, Boker, uh, thank you for, uh, I, I just, they've been the um, sort of the, uh, what do you call it? The, the keeper of the design, the keeper of the Smatchet design uh, pretty much since World War II, um, uh, since they stopped being made by American companies. And uh, so they've remade it uh, every couple of years. They'll come out with a commemorative Smatchet that's very expensive and, you know, a kind of a wall hanger. Not that it's not stout hearted and battle ready, but, uh, you know, for the price that they uh, that they ask for it and for how infrequently they make them, you're pretty much gonna wanna hang it on the wall. So smash it, folding version, G, uh, uh, VG10, Micarta. It just looks like a great collector's piece. So I, I might have to jump on that. See, I, I mean, I keep saying that and I say that a lot on the show when I get excited about a design. So no guarantees, I may or may not get it, but I'd really like to have it right now. So anyway, so uh, let's, let's do some state of the collection. Let's talk about what I have coming through my collection and across my desk that may not necessarily be mine. So first, in, in an effort to make, uh, oh, let's see here. Uh, I, I have to say, um, I, I seem to have skipped over something today and I, I have to get to this. Jim, I know Jim is cringing behind the scenes, but I never did my pocket check, did I? I didn't do a pocket check. Let me show you what I got today. And then and then I'll move on to the state of the collection. Uh, what I have today in my pockets is a classic. I was talking about classics before. Well, this is a classic. This is my Chris Reeve Sebenza uh, full size 21 and uh, with the micarta inlay. That's black micarta. And what's so great about this knife. I mean, among many, many, many other things, but when it shows up that micarta is as gray as that uh, titanium and just <laughs> through carrying it, it picks up your personal funk profile uh, and it changes colors with, with the different oils and stuff and just uh, exposure to the elements. This knife, um, I broke the tip on this one and had it reprofiled and sharpened to a beautiful mirror polished edge by Jared Neve. And this knife has gone back into rotation as one I proudly carry today. Uh, today, this is what I'm carrying. This is my, my main knife. And I really hope a bunch of cutting tasks come up because it's ready now. It's ready. This was a knife I could never quite get sharp enough knowing how thin that hollow ground uh, blade gets behind the edge. I just could never do it justice. So I sent it to uh, sent it to Jared. Of course, I needed a tip reprofile anyway, because that's what I do. I drop knives on their tips and he fixed it for me. And man, it is screaming sharp. So hope, hope some cutting comes up today. Uh, and it's, if it does, it will be hard to resist using this. My secondary knife today is the Alox, um, Victorinox Alox Pioneer X. Okay, that's a mouthful. The Pioneer is basically the main blade, the spear point blade, the can opener and small screw driver, the large screw driver and cap lifter and wire stripper and the awl. So it's kind of like a classic uh, camp or boy scout knife, but the X in the name Pioneer X stands for the scissors, the addition of scissors, which to me are just the best. The, my absolute favorite Victorinox tool is the scissors. But I do love that awl too. That awl is quite handy. Um, and of course the blade and everything else. Uh, but to me, Vic, um, a Victorinox Swiss Army knife, really, really I wanna have those scissors on there. The one thing I, I, I talk about and people have, have uh, told me that there are some companies that have come up with solutions to this, or <clears throat> I've also heard, I guess legitimate reasons why, but I wish on the Alox models they would add the toothpick and the tweezers. Now, um, 
I, I believe in, on Thursday Night Knives, the topic has come up and people have left in the comments what the reason is, and um, it, it escapes me. So if you know it, if you know why on these ALOX models, they neglect to put the tweezers and toothpicks on, let me know, because that would make this the ultimate ultimate uh, if that ALOX, because I mean, the, the ALOX material is so nice. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm carrying in my pocket today. And uh, since we're over here in this, uh, in this area, I, I just want to tell you about what the Patreon, uh, the patron, Give it a giveaway knife is uh, this month. It's a Kaiser Sheepdog XL. I do not have it in my hot little hands right now. If I did, I'd be flipping it and making all sorts of noise with it and showing it off. But uh, the Kaiser Sheepdog, um, designed by Sheepdog Knives, I believe. It's a collaboration. That's been a very, very popular knife uh, for Kaiser. They've done uh, upscale versions. They've done um, uh, Vanguard versions. This one, the latest iteration is the XL. That's a four inch blade. So that's, you know, to me, that is more than that. That's right, right in my wheelhouse. And then you have that beautifully sculpted my, my car to handle. And I'm getting the one with the black blade. I think the, excuse me, the aesthetics of this knife are a big part of it. And just that look, I think it's beautiful. And uh, yeah, this is what struck my fancy, and that's a big part of what the patron, uh, the patron knife giveaway is, is what strikes my fancy at that moment in in that uh, in that particular uh, time. So there it is. That will be the giveaway knife, the Kaiser Sheepdog. I'm only ordering one. I, I I thought to order two so that I could have one, you know, so I could do the research and make the video for the people, you the people, but uh, you know. That's a little self-serving, and I decided not to. I have different self-service to do. I'm just going to leave that there. Uh, so next, in the state of the collection, I want to show you a modification to my Topps Rapid Strike that has pushed it over, pushed it over the top. It is now a great EDC fixed blade. Okay, so I've done a number of other modifications on this knife. Uh, chief among them, there was a uh, pyramidal a pyramid shaped uh, glass breaker at the pommel here. And it was the, you know, the end of the tang because this is a full tang knife. Well, you you saw over a year ago, I, I got rid of that pyramid so I could put my thumb on top if, if I were holding the blade in an ice pick grip like this. Here, let's take it out of its sheath. Uh, but I went a step further because it was still a longer handle than I prefer on a stash knife, on a knife that I have in the waistband. Stash knife, that sounds so like, I, I'm not being clandestine, it's just where I carry my fixed blades in, in my waistband. And a long handled knife uh, tends to poke me in the ribs when I'm sitting down or, or uh, you know, if I'm in a, in a more a voluminous state, uh, you know, poke me in the, in the uh, spare tire there. So uh, I took it down even more. I ground down the back. I took about a half inch off and rounded it all around there. They have these tiny little pins there. That's not for putting paracord through. It's just too small. Uh, it's just a structural pin. Looks like I need to do a little cleanup work there. Uh, but I, I rounded it off and I put some grooves in there. Those grooves add uh, aid in drawing it. I carry it like this. So it's in my... I carry it in my waistband at the three o'clock position uh, with the handle kind of rising straight up and I can just draw it out in reverse grip. And uh, I added those grooves for traction. And uh, yeah, this knife is now great. It, the handle is short enough that I can carry it comfortably. I can drive with it. I can, you know, I just forget it's there um, in for, you know, all seated positions and that kind of thing. So, uh, and plus, with this, uh, I put the top, the original spring tops clip back on. I really like these clips. Uh, originally, I thought they were kind of ham fisted, and I went to the tech lock and to some of the more expensive, sophisticated, and complicated mounting. Um, and you know, I also like the uh, straps for in the waistband. But uh, and I had that on here for a long time. But I've gone back to this classic kind of cheap but stout spring clip from Tops. I like it not only because it keeps the knife firmly in place. Uh, you know, those in the waistband straps, sometimes it tends to move around too much. Um, so this fixes it in place better, but also 
Um, if I'm just not wearing a belt and say I'm in, um, you know, workout shorts or, you know, sweatpants or whatever, pajamas, and I want to have a knife on me, this just clips easily onto the, onto the fabric and you can walk around with a knife and you won't even feel it because I took that little tail end off. Wouldn't mind getting another rapid strike, of course, double edge like this and experimenting again with the handle. So, uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very happy with that modification. Um, maybe next time I'll use a Dremel and get those grooves a little better. Uh, that was hand done with a, with a round file. Um, so, uh, I saw my buddy Ian yesterday, had my first martial arts lesson in a long time. He, uh, he is now the, the sole teacher of MDS uh, in Virginia. So I went to his first class, official class, and it was awesome. And I, I realized how soft I got. Um, not only, I, I'd like to say, yeah, it was COVID, really took it out of me. But COVID was just the, the coup de grace. I'd been ignoring myself for the past year. Uh, so uh, going to martial arts class was a, was was awesome yesterday and a, and a good physical awakening and probably mental awakening. And while I was there, my good buddy, Ian, who is a devotee to Bastinelli Creations knives, uh, brought a couple for me to take, and I'm going to do uh, two reviews on these, uh, but I wanted to show them off. The first one is a knife designed by uh, Ian's master, Fred Mastro. Um, it's called the PY. It stands for Protect Yourself. This was Ian's EDC, he just wore it on his belt like it was nothing uh, for a couple of years. And then now he switched to the uh, Bastinelli chopper, which he would not loan me. <laughs> uh, but so this is a pretty, pretty amazing knife, I got to say. So it's, it's produced like many Bastinelli knives by Fox Knives out of Italy. And it's got this super thin blade with a, with a beautifully, beautifully contoured handle mostly neutral except for that pronounced finger choil and an overall arc um, and then every edge is crowned and rounded over like most italian knives do i think that's a that's a classy little addition beautiful choil but look at this blade uh, if you can't see it it's a super steep tanto americanized tanto with a pronounced secondary tip but a very long and uh, pointy thrusting tip. And uh, one of the things um, uh, uh, Bastien Coves of Bastinelli Knives, uh, he frequently chooses very thin blade stock and then grinds his like nearly fully flat ground or flat ground blades very, very thin, very thin. And this knife in particular, he did all sorts of tests with and unsharpened, it was able to uh, penetrate body armor. Uh, so that's, that's, that's Alex Steingraber's, uh, um, geometry cuts. That's his, uh, what do you call it? His tagline is geometry cuts. And in this case, it's also true. Uh, you get it really, really thin. You get, you get the whole knife profiled outright. The edge is just sort of the final, the final touch to make it cut. So this PY is, is a pretty, uh, pretty nice knife, um, little big for EDC for me, but it feels great in all the grips. And uh, thanks, Ian, for loan loaning this out to me. Now, I noticed the sheath on this, which is really nice uh, and is very thin kydex, has gotten less uh, retentive than it was before. I mean, I remember having uh, borrowing this a few years back, and it was, uh, you know, much harder to, to draw out. So <clears throat> I might recommend hitting that with a heat gun and kind of repressing that a little bit. But um, I like the use of thin kydex. You get a nice snap there. So very happy to have this in hand. And then the the second Bastinelli Creations knife that Ian loaned me is this most amazing separateur. I just love the name. It's French for, I presume, separator or that which cleaves. Uh, this is a, how long is this? 13 inch blade, 13 inch Gnunting style blade. So it has that, that sort of sickle shape or that inward scissor shape. And uh, it is, and it's got this beautifully contoured G10 handle uh, in cross section here. You can see it's a Coke bottle shape. Uh, it's 
it's uh, flared here, wasp wasted here, flared here. Again, comes in thin and then at the pommel widens out. You've got that bird's beak. I'm not going to attempt anything under the camera right now, but I tell you when this thing is in hand, it moves by itself. It is 13 inches long, but very thin. That blade, that blade steel is very thin. And Dagnabbit, I wish I had my uh, calipers. I'd, I'd tell you how much, but I'd have to say it's, I guess, an eighth, eighth of an inch thin. And for a 13 inch blade, that seems pretty, pretty thin. This uh, swedge that runs all the along the back of this blade could be sharpened if you were skilled enough. And, uh, you know, you can special order things from Bastien. Who knows? Maybe you could you could get your very own separateur and have it double edged. Uh, that might be something I might consider doing sometime in the future. He does a great thing where on his custom knives, he'll do cord wrapping that looks like traditional Japanese cord wrapping. And he'll put the little um, I don't know what it's called, but it, it's like a little sculpted emblem or something. You put down the ray skin uh, from from the fish, the ray fish. That's that bumpy stuff. And then on top of that, you put this little carved emblem and then you do your, your wrapping over it, your cord wrapping. And he does beautiful, a beautiful job with that. So that might be a, a cool thing to get is a separateur like this, double edged, have that swedge sharpened and then have that special handle treatment done. When it starts raining money, I'm, that's gonna be one of the first things I do. When, when the money tree in our backyard starts blooming, because it's almost spring, but look at this thing. Uh, if, you, if you can't see it, trust me, it is a light and nimble, but long and fearsome blade. So these Bastinelli knives, they really are beautiful creations, I gotta say. And I think that's his one of his taglines, Bastien's taglines is tactical art. And they really are, all of his knives really look good as well as perform well and if you if you don't follow him on, on instagram check out bastinelli creations or bastinelli knives on instagram he he posts what he's doing like multiple times a day and he does a lot of really cool cut tests with these things so uh, they're not just for looks they they do incredible an incredible job all right so lastly in this state of the collection is a knife on loan from uh guest of the show Israel Bacchus of Arcane Designs. Now, if you listened to the podcast, you'll hear that I gushed over and over about this knife here, uh, the arch nemesis, I mean, the um, antimatter. I mixed that up because there are very few folding daggers out there. Like I can think of three, and this is one of them, that are perfectly symmetrical and double-edged uh, ground. So Israel Bacchus of Arcane Design got together with Felix of, uh, of um, Something Obscene Company, and this is their uh, joint creation, and they had it manufactured by Riot Knives. So um, after our interview, uh, Israel very, very kindly asked if, if uh, he could send one for me to check out. And I thought, wow, that's so nice. That's so cool. And then I got it in hand. And I'm like, this is a shrewd man. He knew that if I got this in hand, I'd be like, thank you for the loaner. I will be sending you money for it. <laughs> and I will. This, uh, not only have I put a little tiny little scratch in it right there, a character mark, but uh, I just love this thing. So yeah, I'm going to make this mine. Uh, the other two folding daggers with, with uh, perfect symmetry and double edges that I can think of uh, that are not one-off customs are the Sharp by Design Arch Nemesis and the Hinderer Maximus. I think it's called Maximus. Jeez. Uh, but but the, it's the Hinderer Double Edge Dagger and the uh, Sharp by Design and this. And you need to have a wider handle here to accommodate that blade with the double edge. And uh, he achieves it, they achieve it on this without making a ridiculously giant handle. It's got a, a very stylish look to it. This clip is cool. Uh, if you listen to the interview, you'll know that um, Israel, is uh, his design is very much influenced by science fiction and uh, that kind of thing. And so this is a, you know, a future space dagger in a way, or could be. 
uh, with, with how he designs. In reverse grip, this knife is incredible. Uh, you have this peak here, which is perfect for capping with your thumb. Uh, the clip, when you when you watch the um, the Jim Skelton video on this, he talks about how, another recent guest, he talks about how the clip is his favorite part of this knife. And I was like, oh, Jim, you're really going to reduce this whole knife to the clip. But I will tell you, it is outstanding, not only beautiful and cool to look at uh, and a nice sculpted titanium, but manages to be pretty darn deep carry without being a fold over a deep carry pocket clip and then incorporates itself into the design of the end of the handle in such a way that you do not feel it at all with that uh, slope that follows the slope of the handle. So this will be when I actually pay for this and own it. This will be my second Riot knife. I've gotten, I, I haven't had too many. Um, and the ones I've had, I've basically reduced it down to the K2, but this, uh, I'm happy to add this to the stable. Plus, uh, lately I've just been on a, a dagger kick, so this is doing it for me. Of course, I would like to get that hinderer, uh, Maximus, is that what it is? Immortal? I don't know. Uh, but I will not get it until they tri triway pivot that one, give it the triway pivot treatment. So uh, that has been your state of, or my state of the collection uh, for today. And uh, next, I want to show you, you know me and my Carta. And I figured it was time to, to show you my top my Carta knives, my Carta handled knives. So usually I start with the small knives and work large, or start with the inexpensive knives and go expensive. I'm going to start with the big ones today and work backwards. I have a lot of special uh, knives in this collection, and of course, it does not exhaust um, my, you know, the totality of my my Carta blades and the, or my Carta handled knives and the ones that I like. But these really represent what what really turns me on about the material. Okay, so first, one of those things, one of those qualities, is how you can sculpt it. And here is a perfect example of a beautifully sculpted my Carta handle. This is the Bark River Knives V44 Bowie. And this is the Moran style handle. It's this contoured handle with sort of a flared horse hoof kind of pommel here and, uh, and a nice uh, kind of Coke bottle con um, cross section there. Or not cross section, but um, you know, when you look at it from the spine, dorsal view. And it just fills the hand in a natural sort of way. It's very, very ergonomic and it feels just, just feels pleasing in the hand. Um, micarta has a, a warm quality to it. I like micarta on, um, on knives, especially in the winter, you have to pull a knife out of your pocket. It, it's gotten cold. If you have a micarta handle, it feels warm uh, as opposed to the titanium. Now, a lot of my, my micarta handled knives are half titanium, half micarta. So so half of your hand is warm, the other half is, is cold in that situation. But on a knife like this, if you were out uh, in the woods on a on a cold winter winter's day and you had to draw your knife without gloves, this would feel warm. It would also feel grippy. Even on polished micarta, one of its qualities is uh, grippiness. So Micarta tends to get even grippier when wet. Of course, when it's polished, that that that, that does present a different problem. Uh, but but it does grip up quite a bit. If you have a rougher micarta uh, or a thicker weave like canvas, you know micarta is layers of material. Whether it's canvas, which has a thick weave, or linen, which has a fine weave, or denim, or paper, uh, lots of materials you can make uh, burlap all compressed together with epoxy, high pressure and epoxy. And uh, you get this. And and the quality of the weave of the material also aids and uh, aids in the quality of the grip. Okay, so uh, V44 Bowie there. Now here's an example. This one was also incidentally made by Bark River Knives, but it's a blackjack knife. This is their their version of the Randall Model 1. 
um, lacking the sharpened spine and giving it a convexed edge. Uh, this is 3V, by the way, by the way. Uh, but this has a sort of paper micarta. That, that's what I've determined this to be. It's a, I believe it's a paper micarta. You look at it, it looks like wood grain. But this beautiful, beautiful aged ivory micarta, I mean, I think that's what they called it, aged ivory micarta. It is, it's a different, uh, different material itself. It's got a different grain and texture. It's way smoother than, say, even this, which is polished, and uh, this other canvas micarta, it's polished, but you can still feel the texture here because the material is a paper or, or some sort of very flat material, there's almost nothing. It's just smooth. And yet uh, the contouring of the handle and the material itself, itself still adds a grippiness to it. This incidentally was a, uh, a knife I would practice with in the morning for a while. My hands would get sweaty and still I would have a lot of grip on there. The, the pommel flares out, that helps, but also it's that, it's that micarta thing, that wet micarta thing. Uh, and I think it's good for knives because people who use them seriously, especially for hunting and 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 that kind of thing, uh, will will get lots of liquids and fluids on their hands. And you don't want an unsure grip when you're when you're using a sharp knife to do something like that. Uh, let's see. Last, not last, far from last. But here is uh, an actual. Uh, Randall made knife. That is a number one blade, but this is the number 16 handle. This is a sculpted micarta with a full tang, but that full tang is slotted. So if you look at it at the butt of it, there we go. They cut a slot out in the top or the dorsal section of, of this micarta handle, slide the blade in there. Here's the one mechanical uh, connection. That's the lanyard tube. And then, you know, they epoxy the hell out of it and then and then sculpt it down. But just look at what you can do with this material to create these beautiful finger grooves. And I was talking about the warm feeling. Well, this is a warm feeling. And it might be because you're 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 getting a lot of it on your hand, a lot of surface area of my card touching your hand because of the scoops that your fingers nestle in. So um, but <laughs> This is one of those. Uh, this is one of those knives with a that just feels great when you get it in hand, and I and I attribute a lot of that to the sculpting and that feel of micarta. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna notice I say the word a lot. So this is the Prather War Bowie from Tops. They use, Topps Knives uses a lot of canvas micarta. And this is black canvas micarta. And, you know, before I showed you the uh, Chris Reeve Knives Sabenza with the black micarta inlays, and I told you how they looked gray when I first got them. Well, here's, here's a good example of how black micarta looks gray until it gets sort of, you know, saturated with oil and stuff. You can see how on the edges here, where my hand has gripped a lot, it's black. But in these channels here of the Rocky Mountain Tread, which is a very nice grippy uh, pattern, by the way, in these channels, my, my fingers don't sink in there so much, so they have not uh, received much oil, and so they remain gray. I think the look is cool. It looks like a patina. You can see how I'm right-handed. My, my fingers reach around to this side of the handle, and so it's darker in the center there. Uh, so I like the way my card not only grips and can be sculpted, but it also patinas and starts to show character. That's one of the problems with having a large knife collection and having a rotation is that things tend not to get carried as much as, you know, you're always kind of rotating. So things don't tend to take on as much character as you might want them to if you're interested in your knives looking like they have character. So patinas on micarta, you gotta use the micarta a lot. You gotta, you gotta grip that handle a lot. Uh, same thing with uh, getting a natural uh, patina on, a, on like a 1095 steel blade or getting that nice trail, uh, snail trail look like on your, 
on, on the titanium on your Sebenza, it takes carrying. And if you're always constantly rotating out new knives, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to get that. It's like buying, you don't want to buy pre-ripped jeans. Uh, that's why I, I don't, uh, it sticks in my craw to buy like a pre-distressed knife. Um, then again, if someone gave me one of those pre-distressed Microtex, I'd jump all over it. All right. <clears throat> That does it for these fixed blade knives. No, it doesn't. What am I talking about? This one, this was a gift from my brother-in-law and uh, a rare, because somewhat rare thing, uh, Spyderco fixed blade. I mean, rare in my collection. I have two Spyderco fixed blades, both gifts from my brother-in-law. And this one has the most comfortable handle probably in the universe, I'm thinking. This thing is really, really comfortable. Like the the contouring, first of all, the profile, uh, the way it swells out here for your fingers to grip around. It's got that bird's beak and the finger choil. It all feels so nice in hand. Um, you turn it on its side, you see it flares out a little bit in the palm. You can see the patinaing of this uh, micarta here a little bit. But it's in that cross-sectional contouring when you look at it in this aspect, uh, that really just makes this so uh, comfortable. And on this one, it's got no polish. You can really feel the texture of that canvas. And I like that. It gives you a, a really, it, it's an extra sureness in that grip. This temperance is a, a really uh, handy looking, <laughs> not handy looking, it's, it's an odd looking, I'll, I'll be straight up. It's an odd looking knife. It feels amazing in hand and is a really, really nice knife to carry around and uh, use. I've only ever used this lightly, as you can probably tell from looking at the uh, VG10 blade. Uh, yeah, it's a little odd looking, but what do you show me a Spyderco that's not a little odd looking? It's part of their character. And uh, ah, the feel of this micarta, they know what they're doing with the material. I'm gonna set this down here. And the last five are folders. I have fewer folders in my carta than I thought, as a matter of fact. Uh, there, there are some that I'm not, uh, not putting out on the table today. But for some reason, I thought I had a lot more to choose from, which means I need to bulk up my folder, my carta collection, uh, because I don't want to run into this sort of emergency again and, and be left flat-footed. Um, just kidding, of course. Uh, first is a prized knife. Uh, this is from my buddy Douglas Esposito at Attention to Detail Mercantile. And look at this micarta handle. This is the Mark I model. This is the large Mark I. He did this incredible inlay with my, my favorite. You know, I love natural tan canvas micarta. Uh, I did not ask for this. He just put it up on Instagram and I kept going back to it and going back to it and kept hoping it wasn't sold, kept hoping it wasn't sold. And then uh, he came on a town hall. I asked him if it was sold and he said no. And after the town hall, I bought it. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. It's something about the combination of materials. I love how big the uh, inlay is. I mean, he did a beautiful job fitting it too. Um, to me, it's stylish. This thing, as I say frequently, reminds me of a an Italian racing boat from the 60s. Something about it just has that uh, just super cool designy quality to it. Yeah, uh, he's been uh, Douglas has been going nuts making these. He's he's putting bearings in them now, and uh, they're they're looking pretty awesome. I wouldn't mind getting a second one, but uh, you know, not made of money over here. Wish I was. Wish I were. I'm going to put that down. I'm going to see if I can fit all 10 knives on this cutting board, uh, even with the the size of some of these uh, fixed blades. All right, next is the... This is another prized one from a, from a guest of the show. This is a Lightfoot Element. Greg Lightfoot made this for me. Uh, if you know his work right now, it is super ornate and just absolutely gorgeous with incredible woods and uh, zircatis and damascuses and 
um, you know, just really over the top, not over the top. Some, you know, I talk about the Mr. Furley issues and you know, when people put too many materials with too many patterns on one knife. Well, he does that, but for some reason it looks good to me. Oftentimes I think knives look too busy, like custom knives with really fine materials look too busy because everything's got a pattern. It's a different pattern. And like Mr. Furley on three's company always had a plaid leisure suit and, and, and a, and a, paisley scarf and all these different uh, patterns and you look it was too busy so uh lightfoot does the same thing but he i don't know maybe it's because he lives out on a ranch in alberta and is close to nature he knows how to put those crazy patterns together and make them look classy and beautiful but you're say uh you're saying bob i'm looking at a a tactical knife with my card well um I begged him to do that for me. I, I, I like this. This is more my speed. And uh, with this very over-the-top tactical design, this was designed by uh, Jared uh, Von Otterloo, JVO Designs. Uh, you should check him out. He's got some really cool stuff. But uh, yeah, this so this micarta is thick. I mean, this whole knife is just a chunk. It's a very thick knife. And the contoured micarta, is a sort of thick weave canvas feels like it's naturally supposed to be in my hand. Uh, yes, it is the the ergonomics and the and the and the profile of the of the knife and the handle definitely add to that. But this feeling of this micarta, and also you can see on this the patina. If you look under the clip where my hand doesn't go, it's uh, it's all virgin down there. Yeah, so this is a uh, this is on bearings has a big heavy blade, and uh, despite the the weird blade shape is quite sharp. Um, check out Lightfoot. He's a uh, Greg Lightfoot is a a classic in the uh, in the modern tactical folder realm, and uh, yeah, that is definitely some of the greatest treatment of micarta that I have experienced. Uh, next is the Emerson Elvia. This is a knife that I've been showing off a lot recently. Uh, new model from Emerson. It's a collaboration with Ed Calderon of Ed's Manifesto. And uh, as you can see, it, it is an edge in point down design uh, and uh, very specialized for fighting and for gross motor motions uh, when you're being attacked. I, I love the knife. I love the design. I love the sort of meaning behind it and the purpose behind it. Um, there's actually a story behind why Ed Calderon carries around a fruit knife. His mother used to carry around a fruit knife and it was her all around utility cooking knife and everything. And she used it to foil uh, a mugging. So he adopted it as one of his backup weapons. He was a, uh, a, a border and uh, not a border agent, but a, a a drug agent, special drug agent down in Mexico. And uh, I decided once getting this very special Emerson, this is, you know, this is one that I had to get on the second special drop. And that's not the kind of thing I do. Like I said, I usually don't look for uh, special drops and try and get on them, but this one I did for sure. And uh, I thought it deserved a special treatment, something a little better than the, the usual peel ply G10. Uh, so I had my buddy Tom Engelson over at Blades and Such. That's Blades underscore N, uh, N underscore Such on Instagram. He does beautiful micarta handles for Emerson's and um, Les George knives and some others. Uh, ZTs, I think. Had him make this in this sort of burgundy, sort of blood red canvas micarta. And he did a beautiful job. He contoured it in this uh, direction. So in, in cross section, it's rounded. Put this great um, micarta backspacer in there with a point, which I think is pretty cool. And this this just has a special personalized um, story to it to me. I mean, I inter I've interviewed uh, the three people responsible for bringing this knife to me: Ernest Emerson, Ed Calderon and Tom Engelson, who made the scales. And uh, so it's, this is, uh, I have a number of knives like this now that I've had things done to that have special sentimental value in, in multiple ways. 
And I suppose that's my way of guaranteeing I never get rid of it. Uh, just have just have a bunch of sentimentality uh, uh, injected into it, and then you can't get rid of it. That's how my mind works. Uh, second to last, the penultimate knife is my uh, Jason Knight designed MK Ultra. This is made by Fox Knives out of Italy and um, distributed by Tactical Elements in the United States. One of the things uh, that really, well, everything about this knife drove me to this knife. First of all, the design is just incredible. I love Jason, Knight, uh, Jason Knight's kukris and his, his bowies and his kukri-inspired bowies and vice versa. And this thing is just, uh, it's just a thing of beauty to me. But it's also quite a utilitarian knife. Uh, but let's get back to the beauty part. One of the uh, sort of emblematic style uh, cues of Jason Knight is this really long and uh, sort of bullet shaped um, fuller in the blade. Love that. And you can actually use that to spidey flick it open, kind of the way you use the fuller in a Medford knife. Um, it's on bearings. But look at this micarta. Fox knives, man. I like I like their micarta. What can I say? This is a, I believe it's black. Maybe it's gray. I'm not sure. Uh, I've carried this quite a bit. It has not patinaed too much, though you can see right here where my blue jeans kind of left a little bit of blue on the handle. Um, it's got a uh, coarse weave, canvas weave here, and it's just really grippy and, again, warm. It's that warm feeling, though don't go looking for this to be warm because it's titanium on this side. This was a birthday, no, a Christmas knife from my wife this year. Uh, she loves Forged in Fire, really liked Jason Knight, and was uh, happy to get this when I requested it. Yeah, sometimes you just need to nudge people in the right direction. And, uh, so I'm going to put that down there. Now, last in my collection uh, that I wanted to show off today is uh, this is a scale made by RC Bladeworks. They do, he does aftermarket scales. This is my XM24. And you have a beautiful black linen micarta there. And then an inlaid, uh, what is that? Uh, come on, help me. Burlap micarta, burlap. I love the look of burlap micarta. Now I look at this and it's like, it almost looks like a photograph of burlap. But it really adds something to this uh, Hinderer XM24 Bowie. Uh, which is already a special knife. You don't see too many of the 24s in Bowie Blade. Uh, they haven't made them in a while, and uh, it was hard to find this one when I got it years ago on the secondary market. So hopefully uh, they'll be coming out with more of those with the triway pivot in the near future, uh, I guess, But uh, or I hope. But I figured this one needed something special. I, I, I do like the standard G10 handles, that come on Hinderer XM knives with the uh, with the pockets milled out. I love them. I love the way they feel and look. Um, but I just wanted something different and uh, something a little bit, well, unique. And uh, this fit the bill. Incidentally, he had this one on sale. He, he uh, had this was like a leftover, or some something someone didn't claim, and he posted it online, and I snatched it up. Again, it's not often that you see things on offer for XM24s because they're not as common as the 18s as they're big and heavy and thick and a lot of people don't like to carry them. So when you can find something special to make that 24 even more special, I recommend you go for it. So Micarta, what do you think about it? I know it's become the, uh, uh, I don't wanna say trendy, but a lot of people lately are making everything with Micarta. They're loving their Micarta. Um, I've, oh, that's, that's a terrible view. I've always loved it. Um, and I'm very happy that it's come into vogue now and that, um, and that it's not so expensive for a while. It would seem like if you wanted a knife with my car to handles, you were going to pay extra. And now it seems like it's becoming more and more and more priced like G10, uh, more common. And the more common something is the less expensive it's going to be. So, um, I'm happy to see that it's more common. 
what I would like to do is, now if you don't know this, there's something called Westinghouse Micarta. Westinghouse was the uh, company that originally invented Micarta, I believe. Uh, had all sorts of applications from uh, electron, like um, insulating electronics to countertops to um, the inside of World War II uh, army helmets here in America. Uh, just, you know, it, it appeared everywhere. And uh, you can still get, or or some custom knife makers and, and hardcore knife people seem to find these batches of old uh, Westinghouse micarta that that is yellowed and has aged in a really beautiful way, and it it finds itself onto finer, higher end knives, you know, custom knives. <clears throat> uh, so I would love to get my hands at some point on some on some Westinghouse, some genuine Westinghouse uh, micarta. It might have a look somewhat like this, uh, but but it but it would also have a variation in the color. Um, kind of an amber to dark, you know, and as it as it contours the area that's been exposed to light or or the maybe it's the area that's been exposed more to the elements is darker. And as you contour it, it gets lighter around the sides. Anyway, it's just beautiful stuff. So hopefully uh, there's some of that in my future. And if not, maybe I'll borrow a knife from one of my good friends here on the on the Internet um, just to experience it borrow a knife with Westinghouse micarta. Uh, lastly, before we wrap up, I was talking a, about how much I love Fox knives micarta. And here's another example. Uh, this is the, um, this is the uh, gunstock folder, gunstock uh, um, slip joint designed by our friend Mike Latham and made by Fox knives to be an exclusive on uh, collectorknives.net. But this uses that same sort of course micarta as this uh as this fox knives knife and i love it and what a great material by the way to have on a small knife small slip joint knife i was talking about the grippiness of it even when wet and when you have a smaller knife especially if you keep it razor sharp you know it's harder to keep track of in a with a small handle so uh having micarta on a small slip joint kind of knife like this is definitely an advantage because it it aids in grip, something you don't want to lose with a small and very sharp knife. All right, well, that about does it for this edition of the Knife Junkie Midweek Supplemental Podcast. Thanks for joining us. I want to thank Jim, as always, in the background, uh, behind the switcher, putting all the awesome uh, uh, imagery up and and cutting cutting cameras and everything. I really appreciate it, Jim. And also masterminding uh, great new ideas for the show and, and for the channel. So for Jim uh, and for myself, Bob DeMarco, I'd like to say have a wonderful week. Join us for the next uh, interview show on Sunday, and we'll see you right here next Wednesday. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.